Next, I'm going to welcome back to the stage uh, Alan White, who's going to uh, introduce kind of our next panel as we get the chairs out. Thank you for your help on that. Okay, uh, thanks again, Mark. Uh, next conversation we'll have here is a chat between Mark and Charles Penner. So Charles, I'm looking for Charles. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Inappropriately in the back row. Uh, Charles is Charlie, I'll say Charlie if you may, if I may, is a uh, is responsible for communications and legal strategy for activist investments at Jana Partners LLC. Prior to joining uh, Jana in 2005, he was senior associate at Schulte, Roth, and Zabel, focusing on mergers and acquisitions and contest, contests for corporate control, including proxy contests. Before that, he was M&A associate, that is, uh, mergers and acquisitions associate, in the business development group at General Electric, focusing primarily on NBC. And before uh, General Electric, GE, he was an associate at Kravath, Swain, and Moore, which you may know is one of New York City's leading uh, law firms, focusing on transactions in media, telecom, and the entertainment industries. Before law school, uh, Charlie worked as deputy communications director for U.S. Senator Max Buckus, communications aide for U.S. Senator Barbara Mikulski, and a White House intern as well. So we have expertise in legal matters, we have expertise in political matters, and now in the investment field, welcome Charlie. Well, it's, it's great to have you here today. This is, a, this is an issue that is uh, personal to me, actually, because I have a 15-year-old son who's uh, addicted to um, technology. And while, while it may seem like a, uh, something that the parents need to control, and I'm not saying parents don't have a role in this, but if you've actually seen kids that are uh, so addicted to uh, technology that it impacts their personal life. It's not, it's not a funny, not a fun issue. It's a real serious issue. And it's a serious topic here. Seventy-eight percent of teens check their phones at least hourly, and fifty percent report feeling addicted to their phones. This is the next frontier. Jana Partners is is a really uh, taking a leadership position in addressing this issue and we're great to have grateful to have Charles here to to help us explain this and, and go into a little depth on this. So why don't you first start by talking about Jana Partners and provide a view of the firm. Why would you and then the second part of that, so why did you um, why did the firm decide to take this course? Sure, thank you. Is this thing on? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Well, anyone, anyone, can someone help with the mic here? The mic's on. It's, it's, How about now? Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, so uh, thanks, Mark. So um, you probably wonder the connection here. I think I think they can hear me now, right? Uh, so uh, yes. Yeah, so John and Partners. Uh, we're investment manager in New York. Uh, we've been around since two thousand and one. Uh, we. Um, are known as a kind of traditional shareholder activist. It's not all we do, but it's one of those things where you do it once and it's what you're known for. Um, we um, typically take positions in uh, public companies uh, and at least in our activist uh, subset of what we do. 
uh, push them to make changes that will benefit shareholders. So um, historically, that has meant, um, you know, whether it's changing a CEO or bringing in new board members, uh, recapitalizing the company, restructuring the company, uh, things that will create value in the near term. We think that value will be sustained over the long term, but they are kind of near-term corporate events. Um, <clears throat> as part of that, uh, we've been drawn in a lot to kind of the debate about short-term versus long-term, which I'm sure everyone here is intimately familiar with. Um, the uh, thing that, that uh, dawned on us was that um, as the world gets to be a more complicated place, the kind of supposed divide between, quote, kind of traditional shareholder concerns uh, and um, uh, the concerns of whether it's the SRI crowd or ESG crowd or whatever, whatever label you want to use, um, that kind of supposed divide was really kind of narrowing. So, you know, the obvious one is climate change, where, um, you know, last year you have three hurricanes forming in the Caribbean at, this, you know, uh, at the same time for the first time ever. Uh, companies like Mars saying they're going to spend a billion dollars to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, shareholders of ExxonMobil, of all places, last year uh, giving majority support to enhance climate change disclosure. Um, you know, obviously an income inequality. Uh, you've seen, you know, a lot of retailers now saying it's, it's, uh, in their, their interest to pay a living wage, you see the benefits that the research, uh, you know, would tell you that you would see. Um, and uh, to, to Mark's point, uh, we also uh, think there's an opportunity in the tech space um, to uh, uh, really ask companies to focus not so much on what may make sense from quarter to quarter, uh, but uh, really kind of taking a step back and, and, and looking at their business uh, for the long term. So. Uh, uh, the, the bio that you heard um, um, uh, uh, isn't uh, totally up to date. So what we're doing now is, is we've uh, launched um, uh, an ESG impact fund. So we'll be taking the toolkit uh, that we apply to, um, uh, we've historically applied uh, to create change uh, using that same uh, toolkit, but applying it to impact objectives. And I'll be um, uh, helping to run that fund uh, with someone else uh, we hired, uh, who I know Alan knows, uh, Dan Hansen, uh, one of the uh, 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 people who ran one of the first socially responsible investing funds, uh, Merrill, and then BlackRock, um, one of the, the founding board members of the SASB. Um, so uh, uh, that led us into the Apple investment. Uh, we think Apple is an incredibly socially responsible uh, company. Uh, we think they're a leader in the field. Uh, and uh, we thought this was you know, an issue that uh, um, you know, they would be responsive to, to us raising, and, and they very much, to their credit, very quickly responded and kind of embraced it and said this is something they take seriously and they plan to do even more. Um, so um, that's kind of the story. So why, why Apple? And, I mean, a lot of technologies out there, um, and, but why, why specifically Apple and, and why why now? And say a little bit more about the people that are involved in the, in the letter that is, uh, should be required reading for anybody that's trying to engage a, a company in a thoughtful way, uh, really kind of thoughtful and balanced in the way you put that together. Didn't hurt that you, didn't ha you had Sting on there, too. You know, that didn't yeah. hurt. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you want to read the letter, it's at uh, thinkdifferentlyaboutkids.com. Uh, so... Um, so, you know, we've gotten this question a lot, why Apple? Because as I said, you know, they're a very socially responsible company, and I think a lot of people kind of confused uh, us raising the issue with us kind of um, accusing Apple or, or calling them bad uh, uh, corporate actors or, or kind of saying you're culpable for this. And we don't really think that at all. Um, you know, I don't think it's, it's um, uh, uh, you know, really a, a big debate uh, that a lot of the... Um, um, functions for which uh, smartphones are used and or, or mobile devices um, are kind of inherently designed uh, to be, you know, addictive is a medical term, which you can debate whether or not that applies, but I think people certainly feel that uh, in a lot of cases, and that's very much by uh, design. And even, you know, uh, uh, you know, Tim Cook has said that, you know, if he had young kids, he wouldn't be letting them use social media. Um, so, you know, I think that... Um, it was not pointing a finger at Apple and saying you're doing something wrong. It was saying, Apple, you're a great company. You, you're uniquely positioned to help parents. And again, this is really the parents' ultimate responsibility. We've, and we've never uh, suggested So it's that all my fault? 
What's that? It's all my fault? Yours, it's 15 personal. Years, yeah, right. uh, no, the, the issue is that, you know, the, the research shows, uh, there was a survey that the American Psychological Association did, uh, I think a couple of years ago, and they said 90 plus percent of parents take at least uh, some action uh, trying to modulate their kids' uh, smartphone usage. But, um, you know, the issue is that, you know, people have said, well, isn't this like a comic book or isn't this like TV? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's all of those things that you can carry around in your pocket uh, that has a bionic chip that could, has basically changed the way that, that the, the world communicates. Um, it's an incredibly powerful tool. So think about a bike. A bike comes with training wheels, right? That's not that you, you hand your kid the bike and say, uh, have at it, but it helps you do your job better. Uh, and again, this is a responsibility that Apple has embraced. So this, again, is not an accusation at all. Uh, but they're uniquely positioned. You know, about three quarters of, of the uh, 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 U.S. teenagers who have a smartphone are, are, have an Apple, uh, an iPhone. Uh, so they are uniquely positioned to say uh, to parents, we can really help you do your jobs better. So you know, imagine if um, you know, rather than handing your kid the same phone that you hand uh, a 40-year-old, um, it had really dynamic controls. I mean, the issue that, that the research has kind of shown uh, with the set of kind of binary controls is it doesn't give parents enough kind of functionality. And actually, the research shows that people who take a kind of on or off approach uh, to uh, monitoring kids' smartphone usage, um, actually, that, those are suboptimal uh, means of controlling it. So um, there's a, a researcher that we partner with at San Diego State named Jean Twangy. And her research shows, and, not, and this is not just her, a lot of research shows this, and also just common sense would tell you, uh, like most things, you know, moderation is kind of the key. So the kids who have the best uh, mental health outcomes are actually not the ones who don't use their, uh, don't use smartphones at all, but they're kids who use them in a moderate dose, so about an hour a day on average. You start seeing problems, uh, at least risk for problems starting to rise after about two hours a day. And even um, there's research out there, a uh, researcher named uh, Alexandra Samuel uh, shows that uh, the parents who have the best results aren't the ones who take a kind of restricting screens approach, but guiding their kids' usage. And the kids who just, have, again, have a kind of take the screens away, when they get their hands on them, uh, have more problems in terms of, you know, finding inappropriate content or uh, pretending to be other people online and things like that. So it was really saying, Apple, you're uniquely positioned to kind of, in the same way that you've revolutionized so much of the way that people think about technology in a really customer uh, facing way that people are just delighted with your products, you have the opportunity to do even more for parents and kind of really help them do their jobs. I mean, you know, working parents, they, they can't follow their kids around 24 hours a day and when they're at school. You know, there's research out there that shows that, you know, more kids now these days than the lunch hour just kind of sit there and scroll through uh, uh, their phones rather than engaging uh, with their friends face to face. You know, imagine if, if they, when they went to school, it became kind of a dumb phone, right? Uh, or, you know, Apple just released this new iPad where, you know, you could do all these wonderful educational things, which, again, the research shows have tremendous benefits, uh, but um, really guide that usage in a, in a much uh, more uh, user-friendly kind of way. So how, how, how did the company respond, and what's the current kind of state of play? And Wonderfully, that? just as we had hoped they would. Um, you know, they said... Um, you know, you know, they said, look, we, we, we think we've done a lot in this regard, and, and, and that's certainly the case. Uh, uh, you know, most importantly, they embraced, I don't want to say responsibility, because again, to, to, uh, to your point, it's not necessarily that they're culpable, but they embraced the fact that, you know, it's the right thing to do to help parents with this. And they also, you know, at least implicitly, um, uh, certainly seem to embrace the fact that this is just good business practice. Uh, that, um, you know, when your your whole business model is about, you know, kind of, making people feel comfortable in this ecosystem that they've built, um, this is kind of an, a, a natural thing for them to do. So, you know, uh, you know less than a day after um, uh, the letter that, that we wrote with uh, uh, the California State Teachers Retirement System, um, they came out and said, you know, we've, we've done a lot, we embrace this responsibility, and we have, uh, you know, we're planning to introduce even more robust functionality, which again would be totally consistent with how they, you know, whether it's Supply chain responsibility or environmental responsibility, you, you can debate you know, who's at fault and who's not, but they said that this is the right thing to do in good business practice to, to, to work on this, and that's what they said they'll do. Yeah, I think it really is that thoughtful letter that you put together and balanced and, and that you drew, drew on research and you had CalSTRS involved in it, um, which is kind of interesting, um, the, the mix that you had. And one of the things that what I liked in the letter, it said it would defy common sense to argue that the current level of usage of 
of technology by children whose brains are still developing is not having at least some impact or that the maker of such a powerful product has no role at all to play in helping parents to ensure it's being used optimally. So we can turn the TV on, we can turn the TV off, we've got parental controls on the TV. Maybe there are people a smart, lot smarter than me in the room, but when I try to um, restrict my son's use to certain applications on Apple phone, it requires many more brain cells than I think that I have. And, and the thought of children becoming addicted to technology and losing social skills uh, as a result of that is something that is very front of mind and I think just an important cause. Yeah, and, and it's a balance, right? And in some ways you could, you could argue that social skills potentially are enhanced in, in some ways. It's easier to connect with your friends through Facebook. It's easier to find areas of, of common interest. Uh, there's even, you know, arguments that, um, you know, some of the, 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 the benefits, again, in small doses of things like, you know, texting and things like that, that you actually do see benefits there. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, th that sentence, um, you know, potentially sounds accusatory, but again, it wasn't meant to, to say, Apple, you necessarily take this position, uh, but it was really meant, you know, there, were, there was a minority of people who, when the letter came out, uh, um, tried to make the argument, as I mentioned earlier, that, well, this, the parents are just falling down on the job. And then, again, there's, there's not any uh, really evidence to back that up, but even if it were the case, again, it's just, it's smart business sense, to the extent that the, the parents worry about this, uh, uh, to partner with them on it. Um, so, um, you know, you, you mentioned Calsters. I mean, you know, they made the point that, you know, to the, to the teachers of California, um, this is an incredibly important issue. So it was a line from them from an investment perspective in the sense that, uh, you know, Apple is, I think, a top 10 holding for them. Uh, it was a line from a mission perspective. And again, to your point, it's all about norms, right? So, um, you know, if, if imagine, you know, kids start growing up with a norm uh, that, uh, because it, again, it's, it's, you know, you, you get the phone, you set these controls, they're very easy to use at the outset. And you grow up kind of thinking, there's a limited amount of time today, you know, that I had to spend on social media. Mm -hmm. After nine o'clock, I'm not laying in bed, you know, texting uh, my friends until one o'clock in the morning. You know, a lot of kids now, the heaviest users are getting less than the recommended nine hours of sleep on average, getting closer to seven. That, that has real health consequences in terms of, you know, obesity and, 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 and depression and things like that. Uh, if you kind of change the norms around that, imagine for kind of the next generation where they're really using these things more as kind of helpful tools uh, and less as kind of default activity every time they have a spare, you know, 30 or 45 seconds. So what, do, what does success look like? What's, what's, what's a home run look like a year from now if you look through and say everything that you wanted to happen happened? You know, what, what does success look like for GNR Partners and what does success look like for this issue that you're, you're addressing. Um. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you know, we really more laid out a process. You know, we're not smart enough to tell Apple, you know, here's what you should be doing. You know, we're, we're um, uh, you know, barely smart enough to do what we do in our day jobs. But, you know, what we, we did try to do was kind of lay out a process that we think, you know, made sense. So, you know, for example, um, you know, we said, work with the experts on this. You, know, you saw, for example, Facebook launched Facebook Messenger, which was their kind of um, a service that kids could use. And whatever you think of that, and I think there's a divide in kind of the, the research community about the logic of doing that, but, you know, um, it didn't appear that they had kind of great um, buy-in because, you know, after it was launched, like 100 researchers, you know, and, and child development experts sent this letter saying, please shut this down. Um, so, uh, you know, first thing is, is kind of work with the experts at the outset. Uh, and, and it would probably be unsafe for me to, to kind of criti criticize um, Silicon Valley culture uh, where I'm sitting today, but I do think that most people would agree that sometimes at least there's a, a kind of um, over-reliance on kind of taking things in the back room with kind of the engineers and saying we can kind of figure this out. So really, um, you know, partner with the experts at the outset, figure out what the research tells you today, and, and we didn't make the claim that the research today is kind of fully developed. There's a lot more research that needs to be done, but uh, we do think particularly based on um, the fact that the, the research into the component functions of a phone in terms of social media, it's pretty strong that, that um, uh, heavy usage in a kind of passive way can have pretty negative mental health outcomes, at least for some people. Um, same thing with like video games, there's years research of that. And then get to your point, even just about television. Um, 
uh, again, like most things, um, uh, moderation is kind of the key. Um, but figure out what the research tells you. Figure out how you can help kind of develop that research. Um, and then, you know, implement controls that are based on the research. And again, there's all kinds of different ways they can go. But, you know, I think some things are pretty basic in terms of, you know, um, more dynamic controls that not just turning things on and off, but setting a t um, uh, limits on, on the, you know, individual usage of, of, of certain functions and apps, and then overall usage, time of day restrictions, blackout periods, um, uh, you know, based on, on kind of um, uh, the specific family's needs. Um, and then, you know, as, as the phone changes, obviously the norms around how parents let their kids use phones will change. So, you know, in, in some respects, your life will be easier, hopefully. Uh, and I've got um, uh, young kids, and I'm, I'm hoping that all this stuff is kind of at least baked in uh, by the time that they're asking for phones, which, which won't be that long from now, to your question of what, selfishly, that's what, mod what defines success for me. Uh, and, then, and then keep up with the research, just as they do on supply chain reports and environmental uh, policy, issue reports on it, um, and um, just get out ahead of it, which again, I, I, I know is, is, and they've publicly stated this, their goal. Yeah, no, that's great. So we're gonna open up for questions. Um, question over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's really interesting to hear your perspective. My name is uh, Emily Krebs. I'm from CDP, which is the former Carbon Disclosure Project. We do uh, environmental reporting. Um, my question is, it's, it's really interesting to see you take this tact, especially on the, you know, I, I understand this falls into the social of the ESG part. How do you translate that to a financial benefit for you as an investor? Yeah, sure. It's a great question. That's one of the uh, most frequent questions we've gotten. And, and quite frankly, um, if I could write the letter over again, I'd probably do a better job articulating it, or at least I'd try. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and I don't, I don't think Apple falls in this camp, but I do think there's been a, a, an overemphasis on, you know, kind of um, quarter to quarter type results, whether it's user engagement or, or um, uh, you know, metrics like that, and, and not kind of stepping back and saying, you know, where's the business going to be in five or 10 or 20 years if, if kind of customer perceptions um, follow a certain route. So, you know, around, the, um, uh, I guess this time last year, you know, you started to see kind of changes in customer perceptions in terms of how they were feeling about the benefit of the bargain that they were getting from technology. Um, and this wasn't specific to Apple, but just kind of in general. Uh, and even though Apple's, you know, um, customer satisfaction levels right now are still incredibly high, as they should be, because again, it's a fantastic uh, suite of products that they have, you know, mid 90 percent. It doesn't take a lot of kind of digging below the surface to see that both with respect to general attitudes around technology and even, quite frankly, um, you know, how parents feel about their kids' uh, mobile de device usage, where, you know, about half of them say that they feel like it's a constant <clears throat> battle with their kids over their, their smartphone usage. Uh, and uh, about half of them feel like it's, their kids are, quote, attached to their phones. Uh, and about half of the kids uh, surveyed uh, feel like they're, quote, addicted to their phones, which, again, is a medical term, which, which maybe doesn't apply, but, again, it's a feeling, right, that isn't great from a kind of long-term customer uh, perception standpoint. You know, when we at least think about the social, um, and my, my partner Dan Hansen does a really good job articulating this, but, you know, he basically says that, you know, is it predicated, is the company's business model predicated on giving customers a good uh, deal or not? And um, I don't think it takes a lot to kind of translate that to the investment case for Apple. You know, their whole business model, it doesn't rely on overusage, right? Uh, it relies on people, you know, feeling good about the phone that they bought and being excited to buy the next one. <clears throat> and I think there's a very good argument, particularly, quite frankly, as it seems like at least for now, the kind of hardware cycle has, has played out in terms of form factor changes. Uh, and it's more now about software and services. You know, the more you can make people kind of feel comfortable and supported within that ecosystem, um, you know, there's a, there's a history of, of um, companies who make hardware that you stick in your pocket, um, you know, eventually falling out of favor, whether, you know, it was Nokia that for a time people thought had kind of, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, mastered the game, and, and then, you know, you could Motorola with the Razor, and, and Blackberry, and Palm Pilot, and companies like that. I don't think Apple is com comparable to those companies at all. I do think they have a sustainable business model. But, you know, right now they're valued more like a hardware company, right? If you could actually see them being valued as, as um, you know, uh, recurring revenue company, you know, again, kind of, pe it's not about the hardware, uh, you know, a new car with bigger fins every year, uh, but, you know, really about kind of people feeling, um, as I think they do today, but continuing that kind of feeling of, you know, this is an ecosystem uh, that I feel comfortable and supported in and, and, and comfortable 
uh, that I've got the appropriate tools to manage for my kids, you know, we, we can see uh, them both preserving value and even enhancing valuation in terms of, of how the company is viewed. Thank you for that. Uh, another question? Question over here, Lauren? Hi, sorry, uh, and, and Nick Creek from Generation. We really admire what you're doing. And, and I guess I had two questions. One is, have you, um, in thinking about the tactics, did you try in any way to engage with Apple before the letter yeah. and before making it public? And, and, and how meaningful was that? And what was the response prior to? And then, um, to what extent have you thought about engaging with other major players, so Google and Samsung? Yeah, um, thanks. And we admire what you do and been doing for a long time. Um, so, you know, it's typically in our um, uh, traditional shareholder activist campaigns, the, our MO is to engage privately first with the company, and um, that just yields better results. You, you know, you think that um, um, if the goal is to kind of um, have the board and management fully bought into what you're, you're, you're advising them to do, the best way to do that is not to, you know, embarrass people or hang a scalp on the wall or things like that, but really kind of bring them in and really let them be the heroes uh, in the situation. And that also has repeatability uh, benefits because the next time you show up in a situation, people view you as constructive and, and, and um, a lot of the same people you, you, you meet in, in this, uh, these types of uh, engagements. We didn't do that here for a few reasons. Um, the first one was that, you know, as I mentioned, uh, while well, we think Apple is a really socially responsible company, um, this, the research around this, at least in terms of specific smartphone usage and also kind of sentiment, was really kind of crystallizing right around the time that we were putting this together last year. And um, I think that you know, this really needed to be a public debate because while the concerns that we were raising weren't new, and again, I think Apple was aware of them and, and works to address them, I think what was kind of news was drawing the connection between those concerns and really the bottom line. And you know, there's kind of, um, for lack of a better term, I think kind of a gadfly channel uh, that companies sometimes can shuttle people off uh, to, even with the best intentions, but because it's not, again, as I mentioned before, there's a supposed divide, which again, you guys have done a great job kind of helping to bridge, um, between traditional shareholder concerns and ESG type concerns. And we wanted to make clear that you know, this was going through the front door. This was. Uh, you know, whether it's State Street or, or, or BlackRock, uh, you know, these are mainstream shareholder concerns. I don't think we would have been successful in doing that if we had uh, just approached the company privately. I think that it wouldn't have really changed the debate uh, necessarily. I think the second thing, and again, this is not a criticism of, uh, of Apple, but um, again, there's a tendency uh, to, in some cases, in the tech industry, kind of take these things offline and maybe not necessarily deal uh, at the outset with the experts. And I think, again, you know, talking about, you know, again, Facebook, you know, last year in December, they, they you know, uh, uh, put up this post saying that, well, some people think that, you know, social media can be bad for you, and then some people argue otherwise, and I think the research is a lot, argument's a lot stronger on the former than the latter. Uh, and they announced some things which, you know, maybe would have been more robust, uh, shall we say, uh, if they had had the benefit of, uh, uh, again, kind of um, shareholder and kind of expert input on it. Um, and, and, and really, quite frankly, the, the last thing was that, um, you know, one of, one of the considerations that goes into whether you start out publicly or privately is, you know, are you really kind of bashing a company or are you, again, starting a debate that can be productive? And at least we didn't view our letter as um, the equivalent of, say, if we show up in a company and say, you know, you guys are horrible capital allocators and you've destroyed value year after year and the, the board is stale and in these refreshment. I think we, we at least tried to kind of go out of our way and really start out the letter, you know, praising the company and say you've been a leader not just in, in innovating in the tech space, but you've been a leader in social responsibility and, and, and we see an opportunity uh, for you to kind of to take that to the next level. So those were kind of the considerations. I, th I think it was the right decision, but um, you know, going forward, we would expect that, that most of our engagements would be private as they are today. Do we have time for one more? One more, one more, is the mic working? One more question. Bob Lux with Integrated Reporting. We were surprised by the way the press picked it up, and my perception, which could be wrong, is was more antagonistic from the press view of it. Were you surprised by that, if that was the case? That, that viewing us as being antagonistic? No, that, that's, it's, that's activism, and, and 
uh, you know, I don't know if, if, if that's our fault, or I think it's, maybe we've historically made it too antagonistic, we try not to, but um, I think it's also just a better storyline. It's kind of boring to say that, you know, somebody proposes, somebody proposes a good idea, a company agrees. Um, I think that, um, you know, I was surprised by the level of attention that it got. I wasn't expecting it to be like, you know, the lead story on The Daily Show and, and, and really kind of to keep going for like 72 hours. I think that's more just a function of it's, you know, it's the biggest company in the world and it's, it's one of the kind of sexiest companies in the world. But, um, you know, one of the things, that, you know, going back to, to Mark's original point that I think is exciting about this is that um, ESG goals, I think, are, you know, much less kind of controversial in terms of the way shareholders talk now and CEOs and boards talk now. I mean, you've got, you know, Larry Fink at BlackRock kind of saying, um, you know, for most companies, we're your biggest shareholder. Uh, and uh, we expect you to be focused on this stuff. And I think you've got boards and CEOs, uh, uh, you know, whether it's PG&E or any other company, saying, yeah, and we think this is where the future lies too. So hopefully over time these things kind of get boring, that's, but that's been my hope for activism for a long time too, which is to say that uh, it's more focused on the ideas. Is this a good idea or not versus kind of personality clashes or, or this being viewed as kind of storming the palace gates, which you know, it's really not. I'd, I'd be curious to raise your hand if you think this, if this is an issue that impacts you or someone in your, your family. That's pretty amazing. I, I think that's, that's a powerful proof point. So I think what, what's exciting about this, why I called it the new normal, is it, you brought together kind of an eclectic group. You're driving business value. You've indicated a hidden risk for the company that uh, you've kind of unmasked this in so, some way. Not that it wasn't percolating somewhere, but you, you shined a brighter light on it, let's say. And you're going through this in a very constructive, methodical way to drive business value. So uh, with that, we want to see more of that. And uh, if, if I can bring my 15-year-old over to your house one day, maybe you can, you can show sure. me how to work the sure. technology. Is sure. that okay? Absolutely. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you very much.